Hello everyone, welcome back to Disciples Church Online. I hope you had a lovely week enjoying all the wonderful weather that we've had. We are in our third session this week of our new series, Back to Basics, and we'll be looking at what is it that separates man from God. I pray that the message blesses you and I hope to see you all again in the not too distant future. Let's begin. Hello and welcome once again to the Disciples Church Online. Thank you for joining us today. This is Vladimir Martinez, pastor at Disciples Church Leatherhead in the UK. Today we want to see what separates us from God and what can we do about it? The problem of sin in our lives. If you remember, last week we looked at how God created humanity as the pinnacle of everything that he made and he put on us the stamp of his image and his likeness. His desire was to have a relationship with us. We also saw how God reaches out and draws us to himself so that we may know him, so that we may experience him, so that we may enjoy his love, his care, his compassion, his forgiveness, so that we may live in this life with fullness, with hope, with joy, with gladness, with love. But why is it that many of us don't enjoy that? What is it that gets in the way between us and God? The problem is sin. But before we get into our study, let's just take a minute and pray. Father, I thank you for the great opportunity that you give me today to share this message with many people. Father, I pray that you would help us to understand how sin affects our lives and how it damages us and what we can do about it. Lord, I pray that your Spirit will teach us and bless us and that after today, Lord, our lives will be different, that we will remove that hindrance, that barrier that is between you and us so that we may experience you, so that we may know you, so that we may have a relationship with you. I pray this, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me read to you what 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 to 7 says. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. You see, this text tells us very clearly that whoever has a relationship with God, whoever knows God, lives a life that is characterized by light, love, gentleness, purity, holiness. But at the contrary, the person who does not know God lives a life of darkness, the darkness of our hearts. Let me use the illustration of a virus because I think we are all very aware of the effects of COVID-19 in our day and age, to represent, in a way, what happens to the flesh, to our bodies, at being infected by a virus like this one, and in the same way how sin affects our spiritual souls in such a great way. We know that COVID-19 has caused great havoc in the world right now. People are in isolation and quarantine those who are affected. And this has affected all kinds of social interaction, education, business, work, finances, health, even the mental stability of many people. It brings a lot of uncertainty and fear and worry. Those who catch the virus are seriously affected in their health. It stops them from breathing properly and it brings a high temperature their bodies start to malfunction. 
In the same way, for example, as a virus will affect a computer system, the computer then starts behaving in a way that is strange, not according to the way it was created. It starts malfunctioning. These are examples of involuntary infections. But what would you think of somebody that voluntarily looks for a way to be infected by these viruses? The Bible tells us that the reason why humanity is separated from God is because we have a virus-like spiritual infection called sin. But you know what's the worst part of this? That is something voluntary. Sin affects our lives every single day, in all kinds of ways. It is because of sin that we see so much crime and wars and confusion, selfishness. People are so egocentric. It's all about being good to oneself and not regarding others. Many people struggle with things like depression and panic attacks, fear, uncertainty, stress. Many people today are very lonely and even suicidal. And there are many more illnesses caused by sin broken marriages, broken families, etc. The list goes on and on and on. The book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 12, says that the reason why this has happened to humanity is because we are separated from God. We're alienated from Him like strangers without a relationship with Him, without God and without hope in this world. But it shouldn't be like that. Because God created us with the desire for us to be in that perfect relationship with Him. But what is sin? Sin, like we already said, is doing what is morally wrong. And well, maybe you think that the difference between what is right and what is wrong can be relative. I mean, after all, who determines what is right and what is wrong? Well, the only one who can determine, the universal creator of all things. It is He who established the way things should work. And it is Him and Him only that can say whether or not something is right or something is wrong. You see, many people today think that sin is not too bad. It's relative. But I would beg to differ because I think that sin is wrong because it affects us personally and it affects all of those around us. In the same ways, yeast, for example, will affect a whole lump of dough, or in the same way as COVID-19 will affect our human fleshly bodies. Sin affects the entire soul of every person, and it spreads. It breaks our relationship with God and our relationship with others. In other words, sin damages our soul in the same way as a virus will damage our bodies. It affects, corrupts, and makes us spiritually and morally sick. The book of Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says that the wages of sin is death. Because sin brings with itself death. Because it separates us from God. And by being separated from the source of life, we then become spiritually dead. In the same way as we care for our physical bodies, I think we should care for our spiritual bodies, don't you think? Sin comes in different shapes and sizes. There is some sin that is very obvious and open and scandalous. Sin that the whole of humanity maybe thinks there are horrible things like murder or child abuse, kidnapping or rape. But there is also sin that is socially acceptable, such as gossiping or lying or cheating. There is fleshly sin, like sexual immorality or alcohol or drug abuse, prostitution, the buying and selling of sexual favors. There is hidden sin that maybe nobody knows. 
the sin of the heart, like lust and pride and envy, anger, hatred and bitterness. And maybe even something like hacking someone's computer, porn, etc. This is not an exhaustive list. There are many more sins like this. And all these, Jesus said, come out of the heart of man and make us sick, spiritually blind, spiritually dead. And they don't just affect us personally, but they also affect everybody around us. But why do we sin? I mean, what draws us to commit immoral acts? Like we already said, sin is like a sickness, like a curse that we acquire. I mean, after all, everybody does it, right? And we learn from our parents and our relatives and our friends and acquaintances, our colleagues from work. Everybody's out there doing whatever they want and we kind of follow suit with them. And that is, in a way, why we sin, by imitation, by following the current of this world by trying to be like everyone else. And because people do something you think is the right thing to do. Just for example, I used to smoke a lot when I was a teenager, but I only started smoking because my friends were smoking. And then the minute I took a cigarette, then I picked it up. And from that point onwards, I ended up smoking 40 cigarettes a day all because I wanted to be part of them and I wanted to be one with them. But now looking back, I realize the damage that that was causing to my own body. But it's interesting to see how, despite the fact that we know what is right and what is wrong, because our conscience tells us we still do it. In other words, sin is a decision that we make. Every time we sin, we are responsible for every single one of those actions. Nobody forces us to cheat or steal or lie, right? But before you blame God for having created us evil, let me just tell you that Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29 says that God made man upright. The Bible says that God made everything good, very good, but we have chosen a different path. We have fallen because we have allowed pride and arrogance, selfishness, and we have rebelled against God and gone completely against Him. We have rejected His commandments and His ways. We have chosen to sin. We have changed what is right for what is wrong, what is good for what is evil. We're in direct rebellion against God because we don't want to do what is right. We don't want to change. We just want to do our lives the way we want. And the reality is we enjoy sin. We enjoy the pleasure that it gives us, although it's temporal. And although we know that it's wrong, we deliberately reject what is right and what is truth. Just think with me for a minute. Have you ever heard of a person who's addicted to drugs or alcohol, for example? How despite the fact that they know that it's affecting their health, their finances, their marriage, their children, they still, it's like they're blind, it's like they're unable to reason. Their addiction is much greater than their willpower, than their love for their family and friends and even themselves. It's crazy, isn't it? How sin can affect someone to that extent that completely destroys their lives. But what about, for example, someone who is greedy and who is only working every single day, doing everything that he or she can in order to make more money and get a better house and a bigger car and a better this and a better that, and then does not take care of a relationship with his spouse, with her spouse, with their children. They stop calling mom and dad, and then they end up alone. And we can continue naming so many different cases in which sin affects our lives tremendously. 
couple of weeks ago, I mentioned to you how the Greek Stoic philosophers used to pursue virtue as the pinnacle of human achievements. But today, the great majority of people pursue material goods and pleasure as the pinnacle of their lives. And that's why our morality has come so wrong. The Bible calls us to pursue a spiritual purity, righteousness, and love. But you may ask, but how do I get there? Well, God tells us how. The answer is very simple. Love. The Bible says that God requires from us human beings love. Love towards Him. He wants us to love Him with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our strength. And to love our neighbors, ourselves. You see, rebellion is demonstrated when we cross that line of breaking God's perfect rules to try to impose our own. Selfishness is what causes us to hurt others and do things against them, things that we wouldn't like them to do to us. But you might think, but this is impossible for human beings to do. And I would say, if it is impossible, then why would God ask us to do it? In the book of Mark, chapter 10, verse 27, the Bible says that Jesus said to his disciples, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. But what can we do? How can we break the power of sin in our lives? Why is it so difficult? In groups like AA, they have 12 steps in which they help people coming out of alcohol and drug abuse. And one of the first things that they teach them is you have to recognize where you are. You have to acknowledge the fact that you are in need of help. You have to acknowledge the fact that this has taken over your life and you cannot come out of it alone. You need someone else to walk alongside you. You need help. It's the same with sin, any kind of sin. It is our duty to own the responsibility for the things that we've done wrong in our lives. We also need to stop blaming others for our sins. We live in such a culture that is a victim mentality. We don't want to take responsibility for our actions because it is easier just to pass it on to someone else. It was not my fault. It was someone else's fault. We need to stop justifying ourselves and thinking that the things that we do are not as bad when in reality we live in a state of total and complete depravity. We need to deal with sin in the same way as you would deal with a cancer or gangrene, something that corrupts you from the inside. You wouldn't be superficial in how you would deal with an infection of COVID-19, would you? The Bible calls us to repent. It is quite simply to ask God to forgive us for all the things that we've done wrong. It's to confess by taking that responsibility and owning the wrong things that we've done in life. But the Bible also calls us to stop doing what is wrong. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 16, it says, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Stop, cease to do evil, learn to do good. This is God calling people to do something about their lives, to stop sinning, to stop polluting themselves, to stop hurting themselves and others. You see, this is only possible when we have a relationship with God. As we said last week, there is this gap between man and God. And the only way that gap can be bridged is by God Himself. He's the only one who can help us to bridge that gap. 
And that's the very reason why Jesus had to come to this world, to give his life, to pay our debt, to remove the sin, the barrier, the rebellion that we had against God. Another thing that you can do is you can ask God to change your heart, to change your mind. God can help you spiritually to be born again, to become a new person. You can ask Him to fill you with His Spirit of love. You can ask Him to give you a life of righteousness and goodness, of purity, a sound heart, a sound mind. And believe me, you can trust Him that He will deal with your sin once and for all. Maybe some of you call yourselves Christians, either because you were born in a Christian nation or because your family or relatives have been part of some sort of church or, or, or movement throughout your upbringing. But you see, many people are nominal Christians, but in reality, not many people have experienced the freedom that only God can give. Many people know a lot about God, but they don't know God. Many people say a lot about the Bible, but they don't live according to the Bible. And maybe that is your case. Maybe you feel like your relationship with God is, is distant or, or not even existent. Maybe you feel like you, can, you want to talk to God, but as if He wasn't there, as if He was not paying attention. Or else you pray and you feel like God doesn't answer your prayer. The problem, most likely, is sin. Sin is the only barrier that separates us from God. Perhaps you are practicing sin, regardless of the fact that you know that you shouldn't, but you don't think it's a big deal. The reality is that the reason why somebody will pursue something else that is not God it's quite simply because there is something that has become greater or bigger than God in their lives. Something has taken the center of their hearts and their minds and they pursued that thing as if it was an idol. They pursued that satisfaction, the either television or the telephone or a relationship or a particular drug or alcohol or anything else for that matter. They exchange the glory of God for something passing and superficial. They exchange God for something of this world. Perhaps you do want to live a righteous life. Perhaps you, you're struggling with sin and you don't know what to do and, and how to deal with it. Well, if you are a believer, you have only two ways of dealing with sin. One of them is try to fix yourself, try harder, become more religious. If you do that, you will understand that it is impossible for us human beings to deal with sin unless God deals with sin in our lives. We need His help. It is an incredible delusion to think that by your own effort, intelligence, personality, knowledge of the Scriptures, your talents or your self-will, you can somehow attain a level of perfection, of righteousness before God. In other words, if you think that the solution is in yourself, or that somehow you will be able to change your own life by your own strength, nothing can be further from the truth. The other option is to trust in the power of God to trust in the power of the gospel to change you, to renew your heart and your mind, to give you a new start in life, to wipe away all that sin barrier and to give you a heart of flesh that can love God and obey His commandments. It is only possible by the Spirit of God coming to dwell in your life and renewing you and changing you from the inside out. But also scriptures call us to live a life of sanctification. The Bible says that, yes, it is God the one that does the work in us, but we need to have a faith that works. In other words, we need to have an active faith, 
a faith that puts in practice the things that we know we ought to do, but also a faith that stops us from doing the things that we shouldn't do. John Calvin, in his Institutes, said that we are endued with reason and intelligence in order that we may cultivate a holy and honorable life. Therefore, we Christians must cultivate a relationship with God and a hunger, a pursuit for righteousness, for purity, for Christ-likeness, for holiness, without which, scriptures say, nobody will see God. But how do I do that? How do I strive for righteousness? Let me give you two very practical examples that the Bible tells us that we can do in order to pursue a life that pleases God. And with this I close. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4 verses 22 to 24, it says, Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The Bible is very clear about the person that believes in God changes so much that their previous way of living must look so far, so different from the way they are now living. It considers us as the old self, and now I am a new person. That's why it says that we need to put away from us the old self that is corrupted by sin. And it says, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. The life of a Christian is the one that is continually working on renewing the way we think and the way we see life continually pursuing this godliness, this righteousness, this Christ-likeness. We want to imitate the kind of love and compassion and care and patience and gentleness that Christ had. We want to be like Him. Put on the new self who has been created in the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. And later on, it starts telling you in a very practical way the kind of things that you can do. It says, putting away all falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And then he goes on to continue talking about different things like removing sexual immorality and impurity and covetousness, etc., 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 foolish talk, crude, crude joking, all these things that corrupt our character. And the second thing that you can do to pursue godliness is in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. 
So the Bible tells us that it is so important for you to remove anything that is not according to the will of God in your life. Be thorough. Take away everything that stops you from pleasing the Lord and to live a life that is full of joy and goodness and love for God and for others. And it says, and fix your eyes in Jesus because He is the one who has started the work in your life and He is the one who will perfect it through faith. Let's pray. Father, thank you because your word is truth. Thank you because you are a God of truth and righteousness. You are a God of light and purity and holiness. You are a God who does things right. And you call us to be in unity with you, in relationship. And you call us to be one with you. But for that, we recognize how much we need to be cleansed washed, purified. And Lord, we know that it is possible because you make it possible. But you want to see us working out the faith that we have in you by putting in practice the things that you tell us. We know that you want us to be in that relationship with you and enjoy you today and forever. So Father, help us in this. We need you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey everyone, once again we just want to thank you for joining us here at Disciples Church Online. As always, we really hope that the message blessed you today and that God spoke to you through it. Just a quick reminder for everyone that we have a Q&A session from 1pm till 2.30 for anyone who wants to join and find out more about this faith that we call Christianity. Um, for members of the church, you would have been sent a link to this. If you're not a member of the church, but you would still like to join us, please, please do get in contact with us and we'll get you a link sent straight away via the contact details you give us. As always from all of us here at Disciples Church, stay safe and God bless.